Barry, how you been liking the show so far? It's been great. I'm having a good time. Meet a lot of people. Fantastic. Well, no, we appreciate you guys being here. Um, so, what have you seen? Uh, what kind of games have you played and seen on the show that caught your eye? Anything interesting? Well, I've been playing everything: the old games, the new games, some games I haven't even seen before. You know, some of the old ones that just kind of fell through the cracks. Yeah, like what? You remember anything in particular? I can't remember the names of some of them. There are a couple of old ones back there. I know that some of the old, you know, the East games. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think there's quite a few of your games represented out there. I've seen a few of them. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go. We're going to go. We're going to step way back um, at first here. We'll probably jump around, but um, I, I asked some of these questions of, of John earlier. But um, so you know these are coming. But what what was your earliest memories of pinball as a game? Well, I remember when I was, I was raised in Chicago and pinballs were illegal in the city when I was growing up. So the only time I got to play was when we went on vacation to visit my grandmother in Ohio. Every time we'd stop at a restaurant or somewhere, there'd be games in there, and I'd be playing pinball. You know, if we go to maybe an amusement park, there'd be a game room. Yeah. But there was even nothing when I lived. You don't happen to remember, uh, does something stick out in early memory of what you put a lot of, a lot of coins in? There was old electromechanical games, you know, the old wood grain cabinets and yeah. stuff. That's all I really remember, so that's like back in the you know, late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so you were in high school, and you immediately started working in pinball. Tell us how that started. Really, the way it started is my father was working in quality control at Williams and said that they had a job opening there, and I talked to the guy that was in charge, and you know, he said, sure, you have a job there. So I graduated school on Sunday and went to work there on Monday. <laughs> no vacation for you, huh? Yeah. 26 years there. That's amazing. That's, I mean, what longevity for one company. Um, so, so you were doing QA, QC on these games? No, he, he was. He was. He was, okay. no, he was doing uh, quality control on all the parts that were coming in. Okay. It was like next to the warehouse where you know, all the parts came in. I see. That was his job there. And how did you, how did you make the, um, the jump from you know, to come in as an entry level person to actually start, you know, thinking about games. I you know, basically started out working in the factory, testing uh, the back panels, you know, when they had the reels on. I was testing those, and then whenever they needed help, I'd go on the other lines and start assembling all the parts, mm -hmm. making the relay banks or motor assemblies, or just, just learning every bit of it. It's been two and a half years down there, and then I was offered a job of an engineer as a technician to the designers build the play fuels and whatever. them. And did that for a few more years, and after I went for about eight years, I had an idea for a game. And I talked to Steve Corrick and Norm Clark, and I think I think Norm, I think Norm was bummed. It was, it was just Steve. He said, "Sure, you know, we'll have you write it." And I drew, drew up Phoenix. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> did Did that come pretty easily to you? Do you remember? It seemed like it did, but you know, I wasn't sure because I guess I learned how to do a little drafting when I was direct drawing up all the cables drawings and things. So I knew how to work with a drafting table and come up with ideas. All I knew was just basically the dimensions of the play field and just come up, up with ideas. They weren't as complicated as they are now with the ramps and stuff. You just put the bumpers and mm -hmm. flippers on there and you know, a few little shafts on the targets. Right. It's a lot, a lot easier. So once you had an idea bouncing around in your head, um, you know, to design a game, what what were your you know what was the next step in your design process? Take take us a little through that. I guess it depends on the game. You know, in the past, the beginning games, you would just come up with an with an idea for a play field, build the play field, and figure out the artwork later on. Because we didn't always have an in-house artist at the beginning. Sometimes they'd farm it out and have somebody do the artwork on it for us. But later on, we started coming up with our own art ideas too. So you kind of work together with the artist on the ideas. It, it just depends on who you're working with. You know, Python was something completely different. You know. Right. Sometimes we do the artwork first and then design the game after. Which do you think works better? 
It works good both ways. I mean, like with Pinbot, it seemed to work good. He had the idea for some, you know, robot with flipper fingers on there, and some of the uh, things he had laid out actually made mechanical versions of it to make it work. Right. Well, that is, um, Pinbot, you mentioned that, what a unique game that was. And, um, you know, while we're on that, we're going to go back to this topic, but while we're on Pinbot, how did the idea for the, the visor thing come about? Well, he had a, a, a visor in his artwork. He had a, a robot with a visor to open and close, and I decided to take it a step further and put the target paint in. That was going to be his teeth. Because right. you knock, knock him in his teeth, and the teeth go down, and the visor would open up. Was that mechanism hard to um, get, hard to, hard to, um, to get working properly? Do you guys have, did you have a lot of trouble with that, I guess is what I'm asking? Uh, it wasn't too bad, really, because we had some good mechanical engineers working on it, so they came up with a, a nice way of using the motor. We wanted something so the mechanism wouldn't jam. That was the whole the main part. We wanted something to move up and down, not to keep reversing it, so you just keep the motor going in a cycle. So we bring it up, bring it down, bring it up, bring it down, because I can. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's great. So um, you've done licensed themes and uh, unlicensed themes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what, how is the process different between licensed and unlicensed themes for design? Well, you have a little more control over an unlicensed game. You come up with your own theme for it. With the licensed game, you had to get a lot of approvals on it. Like we did with Dracula or Dirty Gary, we had to send, you know, the play field artwork or bag glass artwork. They didn't really have much to say about the actual play field, but as far as the way the artwork went, the way the characters looked, they had a little more control over that. And I'm just assuming, making an assumption, is your preference to have complete control? <laughs> it's a lot easier, and plus it's, they save a little money too. Yeah. You know I mean? Right. Well, you know what, we're going to take a time out because um, we have a special guest who's going to come down here and make an announcement. Um, Walter Day, Twin Galaxies, and uh, legendary Billy Mitchell are going to come down here and they want to say a few words here at your panel back there. Okay. So, you know, um, you know we've been showing the trading cards around, and it turns out that the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame wanted to see cards for all the people who were inducted into the Hall of Fame. So we already had, <laughs> coincidentally, your card already under development. So, so we brought a whole bunch of your cards for you to share with everybody to honor you because you've been you were inducted into the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame. We have a trading card tonight right here for you to show everybody and get out a lot of that. Back in 2009. 2009, you were inducted in the Hall of Fame. So this was going to be presented to you if you were there, or at least unveiled publicly at the you know, Pinball Expo coming up. Honoring you for the incredible stuff you've done for the, you know, the global <laughs> industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Billy, here's the, uh, here's the award, the certificate that goes on the wall that commemorates the presentation and unveiling of the card that you can hang on your wall or All right. hang where you want. It's got the gold seal, the ribbon, and the signatures from, from Preston, and from Patrick, and from me, and from Billy. Uh, thanking him for everything he's done for a lot of years, making the pinball industry a very, very rich legacy that will be, you know, people will be amazed by the work that Barry's done for. Who knows, who knows how many decades or maybe that the games can last hundreds of years, but thank you very much. <laughs> so Patrick, let's, let's get up here and we'll do the picture. And this is my personal first time ever meeting Barry, so I'm very excited myself. <laughs>
Thank you all very much. Well, congratulations, Barry. This is great. Yeah. I've got the first one. <laughs> all right. On with our questions. Um, okay. So we were talking about licenses. And um, um, so did you have pretty much a Williams? Were you able to pick the licenses that you wanted to go after? Like if you saw something. I know you're kind of a sci-fi fan. Um, I mean, if you went out there and you saw a, a, a sci-fi, big sci-fi license that you liked, were you able to go, hey, guys, I'm, I'm going to make a game out of this. This would be fun. I could, but like I said, I would really went after a couple of licenses. The only ones I went after were Dirty Harry, and we went after the Doctor Who one, because I was working out the foots with both Doctor Who fans. You know, the Dracula one kind of fell onto our laps because of, because of Columbia Pictures. You know, the, the original theme was supposed to be Aliens. It was the, the Alien 3 movie, but they had to redo the whole movie and cancel it. So we had to basically come up with a whole new theme for the game that they gave us Dracula. But <coughs> it worked out really well for the yeah, game. Yeah. The only other license one I think I really worked at was, was the Popeye one, but that was a post fight game. I didn't even want to do the game. That one you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of volunteered to do it. John had some stories like that too earlier. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. What the lights and talk for green again? He's here. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk a little bit about um, Space Shuttle. So, what was the. Uh, Space Shuttle is um, termed the game that saved them all. And I don't know if you would agree with that or, um, or what, but I I'm curious about what the atmosphere was like at Williams when you were in the process of, of making Space Shuttle? Well, at the time I was actually working at it, we weren't really sure what was going to happen to them. Really, it's like we were in the, near the end of the process of building it. I'm working on a game, and maybe Mark Rich is working on a game, Steve's working on a game. And they come up and tell us now, well, our next, whatever the next game is going to be has to be a winner. Otherwise, we're going to shut the pinball down. That's quite a pressure. I know. <laughs> so I guess management went up and reviewed all the projects that were being worked on, and, decided to go with the space shuttle or whatever else was coming up next. Because we're all pretty much like around the same amount of work being done in the game. So yeah, so you're making you you're making space shuttle and it's a make or break game for the company. How did that feel? Keep you up at night? It was a little stressful. I mean but yeah. they had good people working on it with me too. I mean, we had Larry DeMar working on it. And the, the software and the Mark Springer did the artwork on it. So I mean, everybody just threw everything they could into the game to make it the best we could. Everybody had their input in what they thought should be on it. Because that wasn't even the original layout for Space Shuttle. Oh, really? The original layout was Larry DeMar and Joe Kamenkopf were at some restaurants where they drew up a design on a napkin oh, really? and brought it in. Because we want to play Space Shuttle game, we want you to build it for us. So I build it up and said it seems to be spread. <laughs> and do it. So I came up with a whole completely different layout. And then everybody loved it and they just all jumped in. Joe worked on getting on the licenses for us and Larry did the art and the, the software for it. And we just you know, gave it 200% to make the best game we could. And it's maybe the last one to make. All right. Now, um, oftentimes, songwriters, when they're writing a song, they can, they've said they can kind of sense that they have a hit on their hands. Did you sense that at all? I think once we got the final product done, I think we pretty much knew. And I see like everybody was excited to play it. You yeah. know, Space Shuttle was a big thing back then, too. When they first started watching the shows. Right. So this happened to be a good timing for the right thing. Right, we were getting, we were watching them in school, watching the shuttles, early shuttles yeah. launch, I remember as a kid. Um, so you worked with the late Python Angelo on many games during your career. What is your favorite artwork that he's done? You probably have to be cross between like Pinbot and, and the carnival things you did with Cyclone and Comet. I mean, they're, they're all pretty good. Yeah. Um, and uh, you guys work on Batcast together. Let me point that one out. Mm. Um, that definitely had some unique artwork. What did you think of that? That was a little little strange, I think. He came up with some, some of the crazy ideas with the woman hit, hit the cat with the broom and spinning it around, you know. Yeah. He's always had something goofy in his head he wanted to throw into the game. And, um, did I hear that you um, used to have used to own personally in Batcats, is that correct? Yeah, I had one. Yeah. And you sold it 
Uh, did you sell it to somebody famous? Is that right? Yeah, uh, what was his name? Uh, the singer from Motley Crue, is that right? Yeah, yeah, Vince Steele, that's, that's what that's, but Mark Springer, I guess, knew him, he was like friends with him. He, he came and told me that they were looking for a band in this game, so he wanted me to sign it for them. So yeah, Motley Crue was asking me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why do you think they're interested in bad cats? They probably think they're bad cats. <laughs> so they gave us like front row seats for a concert and backstage pass. I gave them my daughter and her girlfriends and they all went to the concerts. Oh, they, had, they had a good time. That's great. Um, well, you, we talked about how much you like sci-fi stuff. Um, is there a sci-fi theme that you always wish that you could design a game around but never got a chance? And they probably would have enjoyed doing a, a Star Wars or a Star Trek game. I mean, Steve Ritchie got the Star Trek, and for some reason we never got Star Wars. He did the Stellar Wars game. For some reason, I guess they weren't really doing licenses back then when we first you know, started designing the games out back in the late 70s, early 80s. While we're talking about Star Wars, uh, while we're talking about sci fi and space themes, Penbot and Space Station were a really incredible uh, one two punch uh, in 86 and 87. So tell us a little bit about how those concepts and designs came about. You talked about Pinbot already, but um, so how about Space Station? Space Station, I just wanted to be sort of a sequel to the Space Shuttle. So I seem to like to do that with games. If I made Conan, I want to make a cyclone, trying to take it a step further. And that's what Space Station was, because they were talking about the International Space Station. So something to try and tie in with whatever's going on at the time, too. Right. Dude. So. So you're a sequel guy, is what I'm hearing. On some games. Yeah. A couple of times. All right, so what do you think of the uh, Star Wars prequels since you're a sci-fi guy? Thumbs up or thumbs down? They're good, but not as good as the originals. Okay, that's, I think that's most of our opinion, probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, do you think, I mean, are you surprised about what you've seen in Kimball's resurgence recently? Does that surprise you about how much, um, that, you know, how, how big Pinball has gotten recently? I'm glad to see it. You know, I'm glad it's coming back and hope more companies start doing it. And maybe I'll get back into it. I think we'd all like to see that. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. yeah, you said, you, um, and you said before you really miss uh, designing games and being in the biz. Um, is there, you got something rolling around your head, a game design that uh, if you if you were invited back to, to uh, get back to the biz that... that Not a complete yeah. design, it's all just a mess right now because I haven't done it in so long. Right. Concepts maybe? Not yet. Mm -hmm. I haven't really sat down to do anything because I haven't really thought of it until people started asking me. Right. Well, um, so let's talk about a little bit about you personally, and then we're going to get to some audience questions here in a second. Um, your GoFundMe effort that, that you did with you and Donovan, right? Yes. Was incredibly successful. And um, first of all, how are you and Donovan doing currently? I'm feeling pretty good right now. A little pain here and there, but not like it was last year. You know, she's still having a few little problems with her diagnosis. So. Great, great. Were you surprised at the outpouring of support? that uh, came from really, literally around the world. I know, that, it, it did surprise me. You know, when you asked that question before, you know, when did you think you became famous? So, so I think that was probably one of the points. And it, like, who are these people sending me money? I don't even know these people. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your realization that you came off famous. So. <laughs> That's great. Um, if, you could, if you could do it all again and pick any profession other than being a pinball designer, what do you think that would be? Well, that's really all I ever, I, I'd ever known, you know, when I first started, you know. Well, I honestly don't know. <laughs> um, well, maybe a musician. You no, even I don't play anything. I play the radio. John will teach you. They play the radio, huh? All right, well, let's take some uh, questions on our live mic up here. I bet there are some out there. So come on up to the mic, and it may have to be flipped on out to him. Um, there's, there's a power switch, and make sure the mute switch is not on. Okay. 
this better? No? Yeah. Okay. Better? There it comes. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, Barry, again. I actually uh, spoke with you for a couple minutes last night. Uh, I appreciated that. It was a uh, nice discussion. Um, you said something that really interested me, and if I misunderstood it, please correct me. But I believe that you said that uh, Doctor Who started off its life as um, an Alien Three pinball machine. Right? No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, Dracula. Drag drag. Oh, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, Dracula. Okay. Um, so I, would, I was just wondering if uh, if there are any aspects of that um, that game that you really wish had had made it in without the theme change, or did it completely change, or or how should should we say? Where's that game in the library? Why can't somebody do a you know a remake of that one? Because I always had the idea of you know we had the Mist Multi Ball and Dracula. That was originally designed to go into the Alien game. It was one of the features in there. I kept that was like the main thing in the game. So it kind of kept the play field layout. Just had to change the lights and the rules on it. How much of the you know how much how much of the um, how much of the, the artwork and, and the real theming and the sound effects uh, related to the original theme had, had been done before you had to switch it over to something else? Not not that much really, because it was mostly the playfield that was done, and they had done a little few sketches on the artwork, but didn't really get far enough along with it when they told us we, we couldn't do it. Okay. Did you ever actually see the movie after they uh, fixed it up? Yeah, because the original Alien, I mean, the original Alien 3 movie was supposed to take place at a monastery. And they ended up changing it to a prison plan instead. But we had read the whole script. We're, we're picking out what we wanted to do in the game, you know, from the, from the original script. So they did give you the original script. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's funny, not that anybody cares about me, but when I was in college, I got hold of a boot, um, I don't know what you call it, a bootleg script of mm -hmm. it before it even came out. And so I'm sitting in the written script, and then I go and watch the video, and I'm like, what the heck? But, um, but anyways, um, since you like sci fi? Um, a lot of them, yeah. Did you like the final movie? The final one, the final one was good, but not as good as the, the first two. Okay. The third one was good, though. Yeah. The, the, okay. Great. Um, the second one was probably the best one. Aliens, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well first, the first one was a horror movie, too, but that's what I like. Yeah, yeah it's a modern house movie. It's like an action movie. Right? Yeah, they're both great. Though. I know. I know. <laughs> I just had to get there. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, here comes one. Thank you, Noah and Barry. Barry, we all know that you've uh, worked quite a bit with Python. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe more than any other designer. Can you talk a little bit about uh, maybe that unique relationship that allowed that to, to work. And something that comes to mind is my impression that, that Python, the genius that he was, he, he tended to wait maybe to the last minute to do to do his artwork. Yes, and, quite, quite a bit. Did he? <laughs> I mean, was that something that you were just, just expand on that? Was it something you, you understood and you all had a relationship and you could work through it and you knew that when the time came there it would be? By the time I got to work on Finbot with them, which was like the second game I'd done with them, I kind of knew what to expect. I mean, he waited until like two weeks before the project was due, and then he'd work on it for like three or four days straight with no, with no sleep and be complaining that. I'm not having this stuff in three days, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so did you sound like you just built a rapport with him, and then you could work through that, and did you, does that have you end up? I guess together so often? Probably. I mean, management was biting the nails the whole time. Well, what is he going to get it done in time? You know? <laughs> the barrier will get you through it, right? <laughs> That's well, thank Did you get to choose who you want to work with, like from an artist's perspective? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. And other times they'll say, well, you know, he's available, you work with him, you know. But sometimes you pick who you want to work with, especially if it's a certain theme. Because sometimes you don't want to work with Python on a one theme because it's just not something you can do well. He seems just to have you know, these crazy concepts with everything, you know. If I want to do like a fire or space shuttle, I don't think he'd be able to do it. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, right. You can imagine what it would look like. Right, right. I'm trying to here. Carry on. Let's talk a little bit about uh, 
your roller coaster trilogy. Okay. Um, so Comet was the first one. Right. And then there's Cyclone, and then there was Hurricane. So what was the origin, the, the conceptual origin of Comet? Really, it was based on an old amusement park in Chicago called Riverview. And we were going to call the game Riverview at the beginning, but then we decided that nobody outside of Chicago knew what it was, especially since we're selling half the games to Europe. So I decided just to use one of the names of a roller coaster. And Comet was one of the roller coasters at Riverview. And then just kind of thinking about all the different things that were there. We had the dunk the dummy, you know, we always had the dunk tank, I put that in there, and then the roller coaster ride, and some of the just different things on it. You know, the, the carnival midway. So that's kind of where it started out. And then yeah. we took it one step further on the next thing, you know, come up with a new feature going. Put the Ferris wheel, the next one put a double Ferris wheel. But yeah, I still try to keep the play field simple without too many moving parts, because it was easier to serve, there's nothing to break down. Yeah, except for <laughs> that belt that drives those two Ferris wheels is really hard to change if you're very to try that. Uh, well, um, we, I actually found, not this is about me, like um, Alton said, but I actually found uh, a guy who had all three of those games in a shed in the North Georgia mountains. And uh, I rescued those. And um, it, was, it was really fun. Again. <laughs> okay, so moving moving down, I want to talk, pick on some of your other games and, and uh, see where those came from. So you 